Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast from Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business on the Apple Podcast Store or on my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 35 in our series for 2022, and today's date is Friday, September the 30th. First, I'll be talking to Martin Fields, the CEO of Pew Profile, to explore the e-commerce habits of Australians and what retailers should be doing about it. And I'll be talking to KPMG economist Sarah Hunter about what's ahead for the RBA and the economy. But now let's talk to Martin Fitz. Well, Martin, you guys have been doing a lot of research on online strategies and online shopping. What strategies should retailers adopt to the coming months during the economic downturn? Yeah, look, that's a really good question, Leon. I think when you look at the preferences of audiences, consumers going to brands, what you always have in the downturn is people change their opinions and their views. So their sentiment to buy a product, et cetera. So the first key point is brands really need to stay close to their consumers. What I mean by that is do market research and understand what your consumers' drivers are, what their concerns are. Is it quality? Is it price? Is it privacy? How uh, is it sustainability? Is it convenience? All of those things change um, over time, but especially change when we've got a, a downturn, uh, as potentially we do at the moment. And and that's the main thing: stay close to your consumers. Now, how can a- retailers amplify communication to convey any compelling reasons for consumers to? choose certain brands yeah look it, it, it really good i think for that the easiest way is to look at actually what drives individuals purchases with with brands so for example convenience is really important free delivery really important lower prices discounts click and collect products that are only available online Those are the key drivers for people buying on e-commerce. And then coupled with that, look at what are the the reasons people drive. So how do they gain their information? Social media is the number one place that people understand about a brand or a product. They look at reviews. They look at feedback. They uh, maybe look at offers, et cetera. So make sure that you as a brand has a strong social media presence. Secondly, coupled with that is then remembering friends and family is the second biggest driver of recommendations for a product. So what are you doing about product reviews? What are you doing about getting Google reviews from customers, existing customers that you have? And then thirdly, we know that loyalty schemes absolutely drive purchases. So how are you promoting loyalty schemes within your business as well? And the final adage is companies that promote themselves, keep investing during a downturn are those companies that actually succeed. They gain customers and they keep that market share when things get right again. And guess what? Things always get right again, Leon. How can retailers then invest in the brand building for greater exposure? And what, what's and for that matter, what's the likelihood of purchase if they do it? Yeah, <laughs> you're asking some great questions today, Leon. Look, I think if we take an example within that, which is direct brands selling online. So examples could be Marley Spoon. They could be Mecca, Koala mattresses. You know, we can think of brands going direct. So it takes investment. So the investment is you've got to have potentially your own shipping, although you can outsource that, warehousing, customer inquiries, some sort of purchasing platform. However, we know that customer loyalty from buying directly from brands is through the roof. That's at 64% who have purchased their favorite brand from multiple on multiple occasions from that brand's website. So it works. We also know that 61% of people who have bought direct from a brand, when they then see that brand available on a aggregation site or a marketplace or whatever, don't buy from that marketplace. 
actually buy from go back to, and buy it from the brand so it is really real really powerful the direct brand to consumer marketplace um, it is especially strong in millennials and gen z who are really looking for purchasing their brands um, direct from the manufacturer. So there is one example, Leon, that companies can do really well by thinking about how can they go direct to their consumers rather than relying on their intermediaries, which they might do at the moment. Now, the issue for consumers, of course, at the moment, for most people, is the cost of living. And so what are Australians doing to save money, to actually make their purchases worthwhile during inflation and during this cost of living crisis? Yeah, Leon, I, I ran some fresh numbers today just on that point, and I, I think that gives us a slight illustration. So um, uh, we also track expenditure across 400,000 Australians in, in Australia. And so uh, I looked at July this year versus July last year, um, when we know that particularly inflation, in petrol prices were high, et cetera. And I looked across a couple of different categories. So I looked at supermarkets. Supermarket expenditure this July versus last July was up 7%. I then looked at alcohol expenditure. So supermarket, Coles, Woolworths, I just took an aggregation of those two. Alcohol, I took Dan Murphy's and BWS. And actually alcohol expenditure is down 5%. What does that potentially tell us? Well, we know that we've got cost of living has gone up to your point, Leon. So we know that supermarkets are charging more. People have got to eat. And so people are spending 7% more at supermarkets. What they are now doing is removing that from their discretionary spend because they don't need to necessarily buy alcohol. And we're seeing alcohol go down 5%. So that is an absolute illustration of what people are doing. People are making the choice today and they're making the choice about products. So do I buy that? Do I buy luxury product instead of a staple? Um, they're making so the top level. They're also making that decision about what am I filling my shopping basket with as I'm going around Coles, and it's not going to get any better immediately, Leon. And we know that we know that the government subsidisation on petrol is is going away. So we know interest rates are potentially just about to go up again. So it's only going to get worse. So people are looking at what do they have to buy. What can they buy? What can they do without? People are also making decisions around quality versus price. What we're also seeing, what the research of the IAB e-commerce report showed, is that the individuals are not letting go on quality to just buy on price. They're actually shopping around. And it might not be the same product they're used to buying, but it's a brand they trust of a high quality that they know that is at a cheaper price point. They, we, consumers are not at the point of at any cost buying a cheaper product. So keep your quality high, ensure you've got the right price point and keep that communication close with offers with, from brand side, easy to find, maybe online offers only so that I can keep my consumers and my brand at front of mind. What are the drivers for purchase for Aussies? And what, what are the implications for those who actually want to save money? Yeah, look, I, I, it's a really good thing. The drivers of purchase and the top ones are number one, convenience. That is the absolute reason that people buy online versus people buy going into shops at convenience. Number two, and this subgroup is almost all convenience, but free delivery, especially amongst 18 to 29 year olds, important during any uh, downturn, economic downturns that we have, uh, free delivery, lower prices. Number three was already there, but it's here and that's even more prevalent during downturn. Discounts, even more prevalent. Click and collect. We're actually seeing that grow. So um, we know food delivery firms have put their prices up because the cost of drivers has gone up and the cost of petrol have gone up. People are actually ordering food the old fashioned way. They're going to collect it themselves from takeaway. So number five, click and collect. And then we've got products that are only being sold online. So they are the key drivers. Now, 
brands, those are always going to be the key drivers. And actually, we'll see lower prices, discounts, free delivery move up the chain. But any brands that try to scrimp and save a bit of money by having their call center or having their warehouse open or having any of those items are going to lose out because those are not going to go away as the drivers. Final question. What are the trends for Australian online shoppers? Yeah, look, it's it's really interesting to see the trends. The trends are continuing from what we had during COVID. We had a huge explosion of usage of online um, shopping during COVID. Makes sense, right? We couldn't leave the house. I, for one, really thought that was going to drop off. I thought that we were going to see people getting wanting to go out again, jumping in their cars or however buses and going off and buying their products. And that hasn't occurred. We've seen a continued growth of online shopping of about 10% since the end of the COVID lockdowns. What does that tell us? It tells us that actually people like this new way of shopping. They like this new way of researching products, understanding products. Um, and actually, except in a couple of categories, and those categories are DIY, and the categories are technology, and the age group is 40 to 49, except in those three, we continue to see the trend going up for wanting to buy online, direct from brand, cosmetics, household items, shopping, uh, food, retail, etc., has all continued to grow. And retails really need to be aware of this and they need to start putting, absolutely putting e-commerce as the first channel. And especially during the economic downturn when I can shop around for the best price, I can see my, use my loyalty points, so I've got a free delivery, etc., and I don't want to drive my car because of the cost to drive my car. It's even more important to push that e-commerce um, channel. Well, Martin, thank you very much for your time. That's quite illuminating. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Leon. And now let's talk to KPMG economist Sarah Hunter. Well, Sarah, the Fed raised rates 75 basis points. Uh, the Bank of England raised it yesterday so 50 basis points. Where do you see the RBA heading? Yeah. Uh, well, I think still heading in the same general direction, which is up right now. They signalled pretty strongly that they don't think the current rate um, is high enough to sort of contain those inflationary pressures, or more importantly, bring inflationary pressures back down to the two to three percent band. So I, I do think we'll see another step up. I think, though, in contrast to other central banks, probably worth mentioning as well, Bank of Sweden went by a hundred basis points, which was their largest increase in well over thirty years. That they won't go quite as hard. So I'm expecting we'll probably get 25 when they next meet in a couple of weeks time and more broadly I think that that's generally true that we'll see bigger rate rises from other central banks than the RBA over the next few months. Though uh, Jerome Powell sort of warned about the prospect of recession in the US. Yeah, well, the, the US is a, a really interesting position right now in that domestic demand there is running really, really strong compared to their supply capacity. So, for example, uh, US GDP is currently about four and a half percent above where it was pre-COVID, which is, which is obviously great. And they'll be very pleased to see that. Employment, though, is barely back to where it was pre-COVID. And even with a really good, robust historical rates of productivity growth, which we know are such a challenge for, for economies going forward, you can't close that gap. Uh, just with productivity and that's just a sign that demand is running really really strong compared to supply and so they you know uh, that's resulting in inflation and the fed with an inflation targeting mandate obviously needs to do something about that so i think they're really, really clear that they need to uh, realign demand and supply and that potentially means dampening demand dampening demand is also what we might think of as a recession it's uh, it's bringing down aggregate demand so consumption, business investment in particular, to, to get that mismatch um, out of the system. So I, yes, I think that they will keep raising rates, even though we may well see over the next few months that the data indicates that their economy is going into the very least a mild recession. But uh, your colleague, Joe Masters from Baron Joey, has warned that if the RBA keeps increasing rates at the low rates of market expect, Australia could go into recession. 
Yeah, no, I, and I think she's right to 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 sound that warning. It it is definitely uh, a risk to the economy. It's yeah, all uh, developed economies pretty much at the moment. Japan is something of an exception, but uh, them aside, all developed economies are really uh, struggling with to some extent that mismatch between demand and supply. I was just talking about. It's most pronounced in the U.S., and that's why we're seeing the the Fed, I think, being very heavy on the rhetoric and going very hard. And um, expectations in markets, obviously, are for the U.S. to to perhaps take their equivalent to the cash rate to the highest of any of the advanced economies. But that position is uh, something that uh, we're seeing here in Australia too. I said less pronounced, that sort of mismatch, if you like, between demand and supply is less pronounced, but it's still there. Demand is still running hot compared to supply. And that means from the RBA's perspective, they're trying to, what they're trying to do is slow momentum in demand. They're trying to slow the pace of growth, but still keep it positive and to let supply catch up, if you like. But they, they could go too hard. They could go too far. And we could see demand go backwards, um, and that is a recession. So demand contracting, GDP contracting, that, that's obviously a recession. So it's a risk for sure. Um, I don't disagree with her flagging it. Well, the jobs figures certainly suggest that the labour market is tight and the economy is, is mm. and, and the latest uh, GDP figures suggest we're a long way from a recession. Oh, exactly. Uh, I think that's that's the thing. It's a going forward risk. So up until this point, we've, you know, for various reasons, our labour market has been able to respond much more positively, strongly uh, to the boost to demand that's come that came through from the fiscal and monetary stimulus, you know, through and after the pandemic. Um, and so we have seen really strong employment growth this year, the first uh, sort of four or five months of this year. If you look at the trajectory for employment for hours worked, it's really, really strong growth. And that lined up and matched with just didn't quite keep pace with it. But certainly uh, was going strong along with GDP, which is the measure of demand. You're right, though, the last couple of months, the labour market really has sort of flatlined. We do seem to have hit capacity, a bit of a blip in July. But if we take that to one side, May, June and August, the level of employment about the same across those three months, the number of hours worked about the same across those three months. It does look like we've hit into that uh, capacity buffer. If demand, if GDP keeps running ahead of that, keeps on growing, then that's the risk in terms of inflationary pressures. And there might be, uh, we might see is that demand, GDP, GDP has to fall, has to come back down uh, to realign with supply. The RBA are clearly hoping that it won't. They're hoping that it will be enough just to slow the pace of growth. Supply will keep growing. We do still have a working population that's growing. And so employment growth should continue, but at a much slower pace. They're trying to align the two um, and hopefully to avoid a recession. But as I said, it's definitely a risk. But uh, you don't see the RBA trying to keep track with the other central banks? No, I, I think they've been pretty clear that they... that. There's no, there's no sort of one for one link. Uh, there's no need for the RBA to go by the same, you know, pace and, and set the same policy rate as the Fed, for instance. Uh, they don't have to do that. They're obviously an independent central bank. Um, and they're very concerned with setting interest rates that are aligned with domestic conditions. And you know, their read on the domestic economy is that they don't need to take interest rates as high as perhaps other central banks do uh, to achieve their mandate, that 2 to 3% inflation target and, and the other broader parts of their mandate. Um, what I would say, though, is that obviously, particularly for a central bank such as the Fed, but it's also true of the ECB and the other major central banks, what they do and what happens in their domestic economies matters for the whole world and, and we're not immune to that. Um, and so this was interesting this week that we had Deputy Governor Michelle Bullock was actually talking about this, about the, the global environment, what it was looking like and what that might mean for Australia. And so they are very cognizant of that. They'll be very cognizant that um, a sharp slowdown in the US, a recession, that would be generally challenging for the world economy. Uh, what's happening in Europe around the energy crisis is obviously very challenging for the region, but it, Europe is big, it spills over to the world economy. And also, so what's happening in China um, also really matters um, and they have their own domestic challenges there which are not <laughs> uh, the same as anywhere else in fact they've got the opposite challenge of trying to operate with zero COVID and a property market correction they want to get their economy going not cool it down but it, it that will also feed through and, and dampen demand for our exports so they're they're cognizant of what's happening overseas they're cognizant of the impact it has on external demand they'll also be very cognizant of the impact of interest rate moves from the US in particular and what that means for the value of our currency and how that flows through to the economy. So all these things matter and they'll be they'll be thinking about them. But their primary aim, their primary driver is domestic conditions. And that's where you can get deviations in monetary policy settings. Jim Chalmers has suggested we're in for a very tough time. Well we we are in as much as um, for individual uh, for people sort of uh, day-to-day lives. If you 
uh, if you're an individual, and this will be most people, um, if you had a job uh, a couple of years ago, um, and you got a job, you had a job a year ago, you have the job today, probably in the same job. Most people don't change their jobs from uh, one year to the next. Uh, you might have had a promotion, but most people even won't have had a promotion. So your pay has probably moved by, you know, maybe it's two, two and a half percent. Maybe you got a slightly bigger pay rise this year, uh, but you've probably not kept up with inflation uh, in terms of your take home pay. So for any individual, uh, for most people, it is more challenging going forward. We have got um, inflation coming through the system. We have got uh, increase in mortgage borrowing costs so if you, you have a mortgage and, and that's you know a third of people thereabouts live in their own home with a mortgage other people might have um, a mortgage that they've got attached to an investment property all of these extra costs that that is more challenging for people for individuals so yes it, it is um, a, a more difficult time and as I said that growth momentum in the economy is going to slow down that is going to feel a bit tougher uh, businesses are going to start to see that coming through in terms of uh, slower growth in their revenue um, and uh, you know and that flowing through their businesses so that that is going to feel a bit tougher than it has before. That's all very, very true. And, and that's just the way the cycle is going to play through. We've had a really strong start to this year, but I do think that we'll see start to see the impact of some of these headwinds through the back end of this year and into 2023. And to go back to where we started, we had Joe Masters uh, flagging that a recession is a risk. I absolutely agree with her. At the very least, we're going to see a growth slowdown uh, in terms of momentum, the pace of momentum. Right, okay. And of course, the RBA is now going through a review. Uh, what do you see that lies ahead? for the RBA? Uh, well, I think the, the review is obviously um, a separate and much broader review uh, in terms of the, the whole institution. It's not just focused on uh, policy setting right now and, and what they're, the decisions they're making at the moment. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll be very interested to see what the review's uh, conclusions are when they report back in uh, March next year, I believe, is when the, the final report will be issued. I know they're looking for submissions at the moment. If anybody wants to uh, put in a submission to them, uh, what they think of, about what works and what doesn't in terms of the RBA's operating model. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it's a very broad review. It's going to look at not just the uh, the mandates, but also um, the structures within the institution, the uh, the tools that they have, um, how they communicate with the public, all of those things. Um, I think it's it's to be welcomed that that's happening. Um, every public institution, every institution. Uh, should look at itself and how it operates and, and adapt and change over time as appropriate. And um, you know, reviews are a good way of, of flagging what really works and what doesn't work. And, um, and that's what I expect we'll, sit, we'll get from that final report. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. So what's happening in the news? Well, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome H. Powell has acknowledged there are a few things he doesn't know about the US economy. He does not know if it is doomed to fall into recession. He does not know how long high inflation in the world's biggest economy will persist. And he doesn't know if healthier supply chains will be much help. It's very hard to say with precise uncertainty the way this is going to unfold, Powell told reporters. No one knows whether this process will lead to a recession or, if so, how significant that recession would be. Public confessions of doubt are rare in official Washington, but they've become commonplace for Powell 69, whose candor reflects the uncertainties shrouding the global economy, as well as the revolution in Fed communications since the days when the then chairman, Alan Greenspan, cultivated an image of singular economic mastery. But Powell's latest remarks come as the Fed's anti-inflation is making only slow progress, leaving the institution and its boss vulnerable to criticism over the cost to workers and businesses of continued rate hikes. On Friday, the Dow Jones Industrial Leverage fell for the fourth straight day and the fifth decline the last six weeks, sinking below 30,000 for the first time since June and wiping out everything investors had gained since November 2020. The S&P 500 remains in bear territory. We are now in another downswing in the ongoing bear market, said Brad McMillan, Chief Investment Officer for Commonwealth Financial Network. This year, there have been four drops and three rallies, and we're down quite a bit. This do that doesn't look good. Wall Street also remains concerned that the Fed's freight hiking plan would continue to increase borrowing costs, hurting the corporate profits that support their stock prices. And if the Fed is serious about slowing the economy down to gain control of runaway inflation, a recession could cause some real pain for consumers who buy the products that publicly traded companies make. The valuations are compressed by the Fed's actions, said for Ivan Feinseth, Chief Market Strategy of Togress Financial Intelligence. Investors may not see a bottom until there's confirmation that inflation indicators turn significantly lower, he added. And the British pound crashed to a record low against the US dollar on Monday on growing fears about the stability of UK government finances. The plunge of nearly 5% to just above $1.03 came during trading in Asia and Australia on Monday and extended a 3.6% dive from Friday, spurring predictions the pound could plunge to parity with the US dollar. It recovered slightly as European traders came online, rising back to $1.07. 
The currency slump follows British Chancellor of the Exchequer Kwasi Kwarteng's announcement on Friday that the United Kingdom would implement the biggest tax cuts in 50 years, at the same time as boosting government borrowing and spending. The new tax slashing and fiscal measures, which include scrapping plans for an increased corporation tax and slashing the top rate of income tax, have been criticised as trickle-down economics by the opposition Labor Party and even lambasted by members of the Chancellor's own Conservative Party. Kwarteng doubled down at the weekend, hinting on TV interviews on Sunday of more tax cuts to come, saying Friday's measures were just the start as the government goes all out for growth. Former Tory Chancellor Lord Kim Clark criticised the tax cuts on Sunday, saying they could lead to the collapse of the pound. The pound has been hammered by a string of weak economic data, but also the steep ascent of the US dollar, a safe haven investment that sees inflows in times of uncertainty. And Liz Truss's £45 billion, pound, that's £75 billion Aussie, tax cutting spree has set Britain on course for a bailout from the International Monetary Fund, a leading economist nicknamed Dr Doom has warned, and that could spell trouble as fears grow that the pound could fall to parity with the dollar. Nouriel Roubini, an economist who predicted the financial crisis, has warned that British investments are trading like an emerging market as he drew parallels with the economic case of the 1970s. Mr Roubini said on Twitter that Britain is heading back to the 1970s and eventually they need to go and beg IMF a bailout following huge tax cuts unveiled by Kwasi Kwarteng in his mini-budget. On Twitter he said, Truss and her cabinet are clueless. The unfunded cuts have stoked worries about a flood of debt and rising inflation, dragging sterling to its lowest level in 37 years against the dollar. It came as Chris Benodi, one of Britain's best-known hedge fund tycoons, warned that sterling was heading to dollar parity for the first time ever after the Chancellor's announcement contributed to a market rout on Friday. Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England, is expected to discuss the currency turmoil in his regular conversation with the Chancellor earlier this week. The UK turned to the IMF for a bailout in 1976 after a plunge in the pound and tax cuts by Anthony Barber, Chancellor at the time, stoked, in, stoked inflation. The US $4 billion loan was granted in return for spending cuts and higher interest rates. Mr Rubini, who earned the moniker Dr Doom for his frequently gloomy forecasts, won plaudits for forecasting the coming financial crisis in a paper in 2006. And Moody's analytics on Monday predicted the global economy to grow at 2.7% in 2022 and slow to 2.3% in 2023. In its latest report, Moody's analytics said the global environment is more fragile as record high inflation in the US and Europe continues to gain momentum while growth decelerates. Stagflation risks have risen worldwide, but a stagflationary environment would take months to be realised. Business sentiment remains muted and is consistent with a global economy that is just avoiding recession, Moody's analytics said. According to the report, the global economy is at a crossroads as the nascent post-pandemic recovery has quickly morphed into a darker and more fragile environment. Record high inflation in the US and Europe from supply shortages and surging commodity prices following Russia's invasion of Ukraine are weighing on the global expansion and are compounded by an aggressive monetary policy response. At the same time, China's economy is facing challenges on multiple fronts, including a cooling property market and a build-up of risks in the financial sector. According to the report, the performance remains uneven among the world's major economies, the US, China, Japan, India and the five largest economies in Western Europe. Outcomes will continue to diverge in, through 2023 due to differing trade and investment linkages to Russia and Ukraine, particularly in relation to energy products. And the IMF's lending to economically troubled countries has hit a record high as the world's lender of last resort battles simultaneous crises that have pushed at least five countries into default, with more expected to follow. The pandemic, Russia's attack on Ukraine and a sharp rise in global interest rates have forced dozens of countries to seek IMF assistance. A Financial Times analysis of IMF data shows that at the end of August, the volume of loans dispersed by the fund amounted to US $140 billion of $215 billion Aussie in 44 separate programs. The figure, which is expected to grow further in the coming months as borrowing costs soar, is already higher than the amount of credit outstanding at the end of 2020 and 21, when levels reached record annual highs. Experts predict that further large rate rises by major market central banks will push up borrowing costs around the world and risk triggering a severe recession. Some analysts say the IMF's lending capacity could be soon be stretched to its limits, as poor countries, which are locked out of international debt markets, are forced to turn to the fund for support. The IMF's total commitments, including loans agreed but not yet dispersed, already stand at more than US $268 billion. And the OECD has significantly downgraded its forecast for the global economy and warned of a darkening outlook abroad that will drag on local activity in the year ahead and blunt Australia's growth trajectory. Despite the setback, the
the nation's coveted AAA credit rating remains steady, according to global rating agency S&P, with the next major test for the Albanese government, Labor's first budget next month. The OECD club of wealthy nations on Monday slashed its June forecast for global growth from 2.8% to 2.2% in 2023, which included a downgrade for Australia from 2.5% forecast in June to 2%. Global growth this year held steady at 3%, with a large 1.3 percentage fall in China and 1 percentage point in the US, offsetting revisions elsewhere. Australia slipped from 4.2% to 4.1%. The dips reflected the continued fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has sparked a global energy crisis, driven inflation higher, and forced central banks to ratchet up interest rates faster and further than expected. And the federal government estimates that rising interest rates will push up the cost of servicing debt by about $125 billion over the next decade. At the March budget, the 10-year government bond yield will, two point, will assume to be about 2.3% over the next four years. If today's market bond yield of about 3.8% was used, interest payments on debt would jump by $16 billion over the four years to 2025-26, including $7 billion in that year alone. Treasurer Jim Chalmers said the cost of servicing about $1 trillion of debt will be tens of billions of dollars extra because of rising interest rates. Longer term, interest payments are forecast to blow out to $65 billion in 2032-33, above the $41 billion originally projected. Chalmers said debt interest costs were one of the fastest growing expenses in the budget. And Rio Tinto is reeling from allegations that a worker in its iron ore operation sexually assaulted a woman and threatened her with a makeshift weapon at one of the miners' accommodation villages. The mining giant removed the man who is now facing criminal charges from the site over the alleged attack on a co-worker at an accommodation village attached to one of Rio's mines in the Pilbara. Rio is spending $200 million this year on security and safety upgrades at mining camps in the Pilbara after a series of reports lifted the lid on sexual assaults and harassment of women in the WA mining industry. In response, Rio has installed 16,000 new locks on rooms across 24 villages in the Pilbara. It has introduced security body cameras at one site and is beefing up lighting, CCTV and security guard coverage at the villages. The latest incident happened just months after Rio released a major review of its workplace culture and follows a WA parliamentary inquiry into sexual assaults and harassment in the mining industry. The Rio review, carried out by former Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner Elizabeth Broderick, found bullying, sexual harassment, racism and other forms of discrimination throughout the company. And Star Entertainment has accepted the findings of a review into its operations by Adam Bell SC, which found it unsuitable to hold a licence for a Sydney casino. In a statement, the company said it had taken significant and urgent remedial steps, including ceasing junkets and upgrading surveillance, and has developed a comprehensive multi-year plan. Star Chairman Ben Heap has asked the New South Wales Independent Casino Commission, NICC, to allow it to keep operating under strict supervision. The star was given notice on Tuesday to, us to respond to a show cause notice from the New South Wales Independent Casino Commission to explain why its licence should not be permanently revoked or face fines of up to $100 million after the Bell Inquiry found serious failures of corporate governance and culture. In his letter released to the market on Tuesday morning, Mr Heap urged the Commission to show mercy, arguing that the appropriate action NICC should take is to allow the Star Entertainment Group to continue to operate the licence under strict supervision and being held accountable to the milestones on the remediation plan. And Westpac is pitching its offer of a 4% wage rise for employers earning up to almost $95,000 directly to its staff for a vote, bypassing opposition from the finance sector union. Amid high inflation and stiff competition for skilled staff, Westpac, National Australia Bank and Commonwealth Bank all have enterprise agreements that expire this year. The FSU has been seeking wage rise of about 6% in talks with NAB and Westpac, while CBA and ANZ have announced pay rises for staff covered by their agreements without negotiating with the union. Westpac, which has been renegotiating a collective agreement covering about 30,000 Australian-based staff on Tuesday, said it had failed to reach an agreement with the union and it would now put its offer to a vote next month. And employers would have to take a proactive approach to preventing sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace under laws to be introduced into Parliament on Tuesday. Australia's human rights watchdog would be empowered to enforce a positive duty on businesses to protect their workers from harassment after the government committed to fully implementing the recommendations of the landmark 2020 Respect at Work report. The changes to be introduced under the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Respect at Work Bill implement seven recommendations from Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, including expressly banning hostile conduct on the basis of sex and requiring the public sector to report on its performance on gender equality. 
and Australia's second largest telco, Optus, is facing a potential class action lawsuit following last week's massive data breach, with law firm Slatter and Gordon assessing legal options for the estimated 10 million affected customers. Slatter and Gordon, which previously acted on behalf of thousands of asylum seekers who had their personal information leaked online in 2014, is encouraging any concerned Optus customers to register their interest in a lawsuit on its website. This is potentially the most serious privacy breach in Australian history, both in terms of the number of affected people and the nature of the information disclosed, Slatter and Gordon senior associate Ben Zocco said. Mr Zocco said the fact that some customers appear to have had identification information such as driver's licence and passport numbers disclosed is extremely concerning. Optus on Monday announced it will pay for a credit monitoring service for affected customers amid concerns that criminals could gain unauthorised access to bank customers' accounts or open bogus accounts for criminal purposes. And as class action law firms circle and Optus, Optus promises customers' credit mon monitoring services free of charge to shield them from scams, Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill vowed to overhaul laws regulating the storage of consumer data and rebuke Optus. Responsibility for the security breach rests with Optus, and I want to note that the breach is of a nature that we should not expect to see in a large telecommunications provider in this country, Ms O'Neill told Question Time on Monday. In the war of words with Optus, where the Albanese government escalated its attacks on Optus over the company's massive data breach, demanding to know why customers were not informed their Medicare numbers may have been accessed as part of the cyber attack that hit almost 10 million accounts, Ms O'Neill urged Optus to provide free credit monitoring for affected customers. Ms O'Neill said 2.8 million Australians had had a significant amount of data taken. She said the cyber attack highlighted the need for the increased protection of data, raising the prospect of stiff penalties. A very substantial reform task will emerge from a breach of this, of this scale and size, and there are a number of policy issues that I think the public will soon become quite aware of, she said. One significant question is whether the cybersecurity requirements we place on large telecommunications providers in this country are fit for purpose. I also note that in other jurisdictions, a data breach of this size will result in fines amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars. Global household names have faced hefty penalties for failing to protect personal data properly. Online retail giant Amazon was fined US $877 million last year for failing to comply with European privacy laws. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Ben Gill, head of Asia Pacific Brainbox AI, about Brisbane Airport expanding the use of AI to reduce emissions, which marks Brisbane Airport as the first in the world international airport to leverage this technology for reducing energy consumption and achieving sustainability targets. And I'll be talking to Rabobank economist Michael Ivory about the collapsing pound, the struggles of the RBA, and the prospect of a global recession. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business on the Apple Podcast Store or on my website, leongetler.com. Wishing you all a safe and healthy.